Good morning. For the scripture reading this morning, we'll be in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31, if you'd like to follow along. My name is Eric Thomas, and I uh, serve with the children's ministry. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he is appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. This week, I read an article, um, the author was a man named Trevin Wax, he contributes to several different publications, but in the article, um, he detailed, uh, really uh, further, maybe paints a picture for us of kind of the, really the failures of secular culture to produce fulfillment and satisfaction. In, in the article, he cites Helen Lewis, she's a writer for The Atlantic, uh, you may know her name if you're a, a reader of news and that sort of thing, but um, Helen Lewis um, was a part of kind of the sexual revolution of the 60s. You know, what we need is freedom to be able to express and do things how we want to do them. And the, the problem with society in her perspective was um, well, really it was the Christian morality, the framework that um, kind of the Christian faith had brought to our nation at the time. Um, but he highlights her words that are far more recent, maybe are looking back on the sexual revolution and some of its struggles. And here's what she said. She said, our enlightened values, the less stigma regarding unwed mothers, um, the acceptance of homosexuality, greater economic freedom for women, um, the availability of contraception, the embrace of consent culture, they haven't translated into anything like a paradise of guilt-free fun. Um, What she's saying is the the revolution that she was a big champion of, that she'd supported, that many people in our culture still would uh, much support today. Um, Basically, let's let's throw off the bounds of morality. Uh, Let's go and express ourselves in any way we want. Let's live in a way that we please, live in a way that pleases us. Um, And then we'll be truly free and we can experience the fullness of life. The problem is all those rules, all those moral restrictions in our lives. So uh, upon reading this article... Uh, she went on to conclude um, that while the sexual revolution um, had promised greater freedom and fulfillment, uh, the trouble, she concluded, is that for some reason seems thing, uh, things seem to have only gotten worse. Um, she said the problem with people is that we never want the things that we should. And as a result, people are more unhappy, and this is in the particular realm of sexuality, but it's true across the board. People are more unhappy now than they were before. We thought that if we throw off kind of all of God's design and, you know, biblical values and all that, that then, you know, we could have be free. But in reality, um, those revolutions, if you will, they didn't produce what they promised, and they've ultimately left people more empty and less satisfied than they were before. Um, Church, what I would want you to know is that we are living in a post-Christian culture. 
Our, our culture has rejected the truth of God. Um, I'm not sure that we ever fully embraced it. You know, as, as a nation, we're not a theocracy. Uh, but, I mean, there were times where we did live more moral lives, and there, was, uh, there were more agreed-upon values, moral and ethical um, restrictions that people would all have agreed to. Today, we live in a culture that has rejected certainly Christianity and the morality thereof, and really any social norms at all. It's kind of um, do as you wish, live as you please, whatever makes you happy, you should do it. But as I read this article and I saw you know, this woman who's pretty noteworthy and fairly accomplished, that years and years and years and years after the sexual revolution, she's looking back and she's lamenting the fact that things still didn't get better. And what we should see in that is what's occurring all across our nation, all across the world now. Um, the same thing that happens with anyone who does not have the hope of Jesus Christ. They are turning to empty things, hoping that those things will ultimately satisfy them and fulfill them and give them meaning. And over time, they're finding them to be empty. And it leads them to desperation. And they'll turn to thing after thing after thing. And they'll never be satisfied. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I asked the question for us as a church, how should we respond uh, when we find ourselves at odds with culture? And I said we should seek the truth and stand on the truth, that we should lovingly serve other people. Um, but to be honest with you, uh, that's not all that we, we, can, we should do. As we look out at our culture, our society, our friends and our coworkers, our city, um, and we see people who are wrestling with these questions, what believers have to do is engage we have got to be the church of Jesus Christ. We've got to take the gospel, the hope of the world, to people who desperately need to hear it. And I just wondered about this, this woman who was this author. If maybe decades ago someone could have shared the truth of the gospel with her and she could have found fulfillment in Jesus Christ and that maybe today she could have been writing a different article rather than lamenting that things have only gotten worse and she doesn't know what the solution is. She could be praising God for the fulfillment that she's ultimately found in him. Today, I want to talk to you about the church's role, um, not just in kind of existing in the midst of a difficult culture, but what is our role uh, as messengers of hope um, to people who desperately need to hear the truth of God's word? If you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Um, the Apostle Paul has continued his missionary journeys. He was in Thessalonica. Things seemed to be going really, really well. And then some Jews rose up. They stirred up trouble for him, and he had to flee there. And he went to Berea, where he found uh, what he called noble Jews, because they were, they were readily accepting the Word of God. And then they would look to the Scriptures to see if the things that Paul uh, was saying, if those things were true. Uh, but then the Jews came from Thessalonica, and they stirred up trouble at Berea, such that Paul has to flee again. And he finds himself in the city of Athens. Um, Timothy and Silas had not yet joined him. He'd sent word that they needed to join him in the city, and he's just waiting. This is kind of a, an in-between, if you will, for the Apostle Paul. Uh, but the city of Athens was somewhat unique uh, among uh, you know, the, the, the Greco-Roman culture, if you will. As a matter of fact, it was kind of the center of Greco-Roman culture. A, a few things. Um, Athens was the center of art, of culture, and philosophy at the time. If you know these philosophers, they would have called Athens their home. Um, there's uh, Socrates, there's Plato, and it was the adopted home of Aristotle. So these men, they would spend a great deal of time in the city, and kind of the way that things worked out, there was a marketplace there um, within Athens. And so, yes, people sold goods there. They would display their sculptures and the works of art, and they would spend a tremendous amount of time debating various ideas and various philosophies within the city. Um, within the city of Athens, um, it was pretty pluralistic, lots of different views uh, about the existence of God and who God was, how many gods there were. Uh, it was pretty pluralistic, and they would sit around, they would discuss these ideas together all day, the Apostle Paul is going to tell us. He would, they would spend time discussing these things. So Paul finds himself in the city of Athens. He didn't intend necessarily to be there. This isn't one of those things where God had called him to be there, but certainly we can see that it was God's intention for Paul to wind up in the city of Athens. And in verse uh, 16, it says, Now while Paul was waiting for them, this is T uh, Timothy and Silas, while he was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Everywhere he looked, there was another 
lower G, God, uh, another shrine, another temple, and people were giving themselves to these things, believing that these gods were going to enrich their lives, when in reality, um, those gods were empty. They were only going to lead to greater destruction, to greater suffering. And so Paul, as he walks throughout the city, he is rightfully grieved. And I want, you to say, I want to say to you that our response should be the same. When we see the brokenness of our culture, when we see lies being told, people believing things that simply aren't true, people headed on the path toward destruction, we too should be grieved. If we're not, it's because we aren't loving our culture. If we're not grieved by what we see in the lives of people, it's because we don't care, and that would really be a problem. We should be grieved when we see the brokenness around us, when we hear the stories, uh, the way that people are ultimately responding. Um, what we know is that to deviate from God's plan and God's design in any way, and whether that be for his family, for our sexuality, for uh, even the, the family unit itself, for anything, any moral, ethical value in the world, to deviate from God's design is going to lead us to destruction. And so when we see that, we shouldn't be ambivalent. We shouldn't be uncaring. We shouldn't be flippant. We shouldn't even be angry. But what we should be is grieved. Because when we deviate from God's design, it's always destructive. If we love people, if we love our friends and our family, when we see them headed for destruction, we can never be passive about that. As a matter of fact, to sit idly by uh, while someone is headed for destruction, that's profoundly unloving, right? Now, the value of our culture says we need to be tolerant, we need to be accepting, we need to be approving of just about anyone and anything. But let me tell you, that is not a biblical value. If we love our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, what we will do is we will point out the fact that they might be headed toward destruction. That is the most loving thing we could ever do is say, hey, hey um, I know you believe this. I know this is how you're living your life. Can I tell you, can I share with you the hope of Jesus Christ? Can I share with you the truth of the gospel and the truth of God's word over your life? Because what we know is that any deviation from God's design is going to lead toward destruction. So the Apostle Paul, he finds himself in the city of Athens, and he's grieved, again, as we should be, over our culture. But I want you to see how he responds. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't rant on social media, right? He doesn't, he's not terrible toward people like, how could you do this thing? Paul understands that apart from the gospel, uh, lives will not be changed. Paul understands that apart from following after Jesus Christ, we as people, every one of us, apart from Jesus Christ, will chase after any number of empty things. So he sees what's going on in the city. And in verse 17, we see what he chooses to do. It says, so he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Uh, down a little lower in the text, you're going to see that the people, um, because the Apostle Paul chose to engage uh, the, the culture with the broken parts of culture, because the Apostle Paul chose, rather than say, you know what, um, I've been chased out of a couple of cities, we've been doing a great work, I'm going to take a vacation now, like that's not what he did. Uh, he chose to say, God, you brought me here and you placed me in this city at this time for a specific purpose, he chose to engage with the people there. You know, the, the first word of the, the Great Commission is go. And whether we translate that as a participle, you know, as you are going, you may have heard that, or as a, as a command from God that we should go, what Jesus Christ has called his church to do is to go and make disciples of the nations. What we are not supposed to do is just gather here on Sunday and then sit on our hands and complain about the world that we live in, but rather the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ is to go and to make disciples of people who are not yet his disciples. We have got to be going. Like part of the reason, I think the reason the church has lost its influence in the culture in which we live, the reason that people aren't looking to us and they don't care what we have to say is because for about the last 20 or 30 years, church has become something that people attend. Church has become something where we make a decision about where we go based upon how good is the music and the facilities. You know, they have, they have a good parking lot. I don't know why you're here. That's clearly not y'all, right? Uh, how good is the children's ministry? Like, how can the church serve me? That's how we made a decision about where we go to church. 
And we become consumers rather than, than, rather than being consumed by the mission that Jesus Christ has given us to go and make disciples of the nation. We thought that what God really wants us to do is gather together and just be the church, a little holy huddle, right? And as a result, because the church is being content to gather but not to go, in our world, our, our nation in, parti in particular, and we're in decline God's truths are being abandoned. The world's in a bad place. But here's the good news. We have the hope of the gospel. We have the word of God. We have the spirit of God. And he's called us to go into the world in which we live and to begin to make disciples there. Uh, so the first thing that apostle, the apostle Paul did uh, was he went to the people. He engaged with them. Again, he didn't hide back like, hey, you know, I'm just going to you know, hide out, wait for you know, Silas and Timothy and Luke, and we'll just have our little church service. No, no, he went to the people. As a matter of fact, you see it in verse 17. To the Jews and the devout persons... People who had a semblance of faith, uh, although they, they clearly weren't Christians yet, and he went where they were. He went to the synagogues. And the people who had very little interest in faith, or maybe those who were worshiping all sorts of other gods, uh, the Apostle Paul, he went to the marketplace. To the agora is what this is called, where, where they would have all of these discussions and where they were, you know, displaying their art and having the conversations about what truth was and, you know, how the world functioned, the, the philosophical arguments of the day. And he went to those people and he began to share with them the truth of God's word. Now, our, our church here, um, I want you to know, I don't think this is true of us. I, I don't want to uh, speak negatively about us being a church that doesn't care because I, I believe that we do. Uh, but I do believe we've got to continue to grow and be better about going out of this place and making disciples in our city. Like this is profoundly important. And I, I hear stories every single week of addiction and abuse, of suffering in ways that it, I couldn't even sit up here and describe to you. It wouldn't be appropriate. Y'all, our city needs the hope of the gospel. And the good news is that Jesus Christ in his grace has placed his church in this city to take the hope to people that desperately need it. So just as the apostle Paul went, just as Jesus Christ came to us, so we need to go to the world. So the Apostle Paul, reasoning in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons in the marketplace with those who happen to be there, he has these discussions and conversations, and it, it wasn't all that well-received, as you're going to see. Uh, but he went, and, and, and that's half the battle, right? Just showing up and making yourself available to God. You may feel like today, like you don't have anything to contribute, but I want you to know that you have the Holy Spirit of God within you. You have the truth of God's Word in your hand. God wants to use you in your neighborhood, and in your workplace, in your circumstances, he wants to use you today. He wants to use you tomorrow. Just make yourself available to him and watch what God might do. So Paul first went to the people. The second thing that he did was he engaged with their beliefs. Look in verse 18. Uh, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They ultimately took him uh, and they brought him to the Areopagus. This was kind of like the, the city officials, if you will, maybe the leading thinkers and philosophers. And they wanted to hear what the Apostle Paul had to say. So they asked him, may we know this new teaching that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They were very interested in what the Apostle Paul had to say. Now, you shouldn't think of them as really seeking to know Christ. They did this all day, every day. This wasn't unique. They were just kind of interested in hearing this new form of teaching. But the Apostle Paul engaged with their beliefs. In verse 17, when it says he reasoned in the synagogue, uh, Tim Keller notes that the, the word here for reasoning, um, it should point us to uh, not just like having a, a discussion, if you will, but more like the Socratic method, if you're familiar with that, uh, which would have meant the Apostle Paul would have spent a great deal of time listening and seeking to understand the beliefs of the various groups uh, with whom he was conversing. 
What did the Epicureans believe? What did the Stoics believe? And so he would first understand what they believed. Um, then he would point out some weaknesses, uh, you know, with, with their belief system. And then he would present the gospel of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to them. So he took the time to engage with the beliefs of the people. Now, um, the Epicureans in particular, uh, I, I've gone through this once before, but I want to kind of clarify once again. The Epicureans were interesting. They were a lot like people in our culture, right? Um, they believed in God to a sense. Um, they even worshipped an unknown God, so they weren't really all that um, concerned about who the God was because the Epicureans believed that while there probably was a God out there or many gods, those gods were not involved in the day-to-day -day lives of humans, you know, God's doing something, but he doesn't really care about what's going on with us. Uh, they believe that God's neither punished you when you did wrong nor helped you when you were in trouble. So in times of suffering, you were largely on your own. Uh, they thought that worship in the temples, which there were temples all around, there were idols, they thought it was foolish because, well, the gods didn't really care and they didn't intervene in humans, human life. Uh, their philosophy, you may have heard this, was eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you shall die. So the, from Epicurean philosophy was kind of the thinking that uh, when you're suffering and when life is hard, when you're sick, when you're enduring loss, um, there's no hope. You can't pray to God and hope that he's going to fix it. They don't really care. There's not much you can do about it yourself. And so the way that they would deal with their suffering and the difficulty was they'd turn to pleasure. And they would get drunk. Or they would go and fornicate at a temple. They would go and engage in something uh, to help themselves forget or to feel better from whatever thing it was that they were suffering. And it was empty. On the other hand, in the city, these were kind of the two dominant philosophies at, at the time, uh, were the Stoics. Now, the Stoics believed um, Kind of that God was in everything. The essence of God was in all of nature. And that if you really wanted to attain freedom in this life, uh, you would live in harmony with the natural creation. So the universe is governed by reason. It's what they believe. The universe is governed by reason. And so um, if you wanted to navigate life well, you needed to transcend passionate emotion and just live a life of reasoning. They were stoic in their presentation. Um, so they would teach you to avoid fear. Well, that's irrational. Rise above fear. Think your way through it. They would teach you to avoid envy. They would teach you to avoid passionate love or even hope because that was the foolish way of approaching life. And so the Stoics did believe in God in, in some ways, the God of trees or, you know, various things. They would even worship in some way. But the goal was to rise above intellectually anything that you might feel passionately within your body. So when your loved one gets sick or your loved one dies or the catastrophe happens, you shouldn't mourn and you shouldn't wail. You shouldn't carry on. Um, death is a fact of life. Suffering is a fact of life. And so, essentially, they didn't say it this way, you should get over it and move on. Because that's what's going to come. Your life is predetermined. Suffering is going to come to all of us. So rise above it and don't let it affect you. And both of these systems are profoundly hopeless. And so it's no wonder that they spent all of their days discussing these new ideas and new philosophies because they clearly found theirs to be empty. Church, there are unknown gods in our culture, just as the Epicureans or the Stoics would have worshipped. There are these beliefs in our culture. There are people living lives without hope. And they're trying to make sense of what's right and what's wrong and how they should live. And they're wondering why suffering is present in their lives. They're wondering why things didn't work out with their marriage, why they seem to be struggling in their finances, or why when they get plenty of money they still feel empty. And the hope of the world is a church that will go to those people and engage with them and ultimately begin to share the truth of God's word to the people. Look here in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, this was a gathering of the council, but lots of people were likely listening. And he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. Man, y'all are seeking after something. I've looked around your city. There are gods everywhere. 
There are temples and there are shrines. You're very religious. You love to discuss these ideas. Or as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship, and I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Now, if, if you'll remember, the people have just said twice to the Apostle Paul, we want to know this thing that you're teaching. Like, we want to understand and know this new idea. Now, they were okay with worshiping an unknown God in their, their culture, but they wanted to really fully understand what the Apostle Paul had to say. He said, to the unknown God, uh, what therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and of earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. The God of the universe is not disinterested and uninvolved in human life. As a matter of fact, he gives us our life and our breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Uh, he's actually quoting their philosophers here. He understood very well uh, what they were believing. He goes on and says, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, uh, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by, uh, I'm sorry, by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So the Apostle Paul, he went to the people and he engaged with their beliefs. But then uh, at this point in his message, uh, he begins to engage with the beliefs of the people. He presents to the truth of the gospel. Um, he wants to be really clear. God created us. And he told it to people in Athens 2,000 years ago, and it's true for us today. God created us. He created all of the world, the heavens and the earth, everything that we know and see. God is the one who has given us life and breath. You were created as you are, knit together in your mother's womb with your strengths and weaknesses and abilities and aptitudes, the things that you love about yourself and even the things that you're not so fond of. God created you here on this earth and he did so for a very specific purpose. Your life isn't without meaning, and your life isn't without hope. However, um, contrary to American popular belief, um, you are not the center of the world. I am not the center of this world. God is. All of this was created by God and for God and for his glory. And if you want your life to know meaning, you want your life to have purpose, you want to understand why you're here, you look back to your creator who made you as you are. He placed you in this place and at this time. And his purpose is ultimately to redeem this fallen and broken world. Y'all, that's us. And he has created us just as we are he has gathered this body of believers in this city at this time and in this place to fulfill his purposes. So as we leave here, you should see that God created you perfectly for the good works that he wanted you to walk in, that he crafted you just as you are. And you might look in the mirror and see things you don't like, and that's absolutely true. Our bodies have been broken and scarred by sin, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are made new and we've been commissioned to go and take hope to a world who desperately needs to hear it. So the Apostle Paul, he preaches the truth of Jesus Christ, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And to be honest with you, they didn't receive him all that well. When he began preaching, they called him a babbler. This was a phrase of mocking. They're like basically like, you don't have a, an original thought, Paul. And you're just picking and choosing from various you know, ideas you've heard, and you're kind of regurgitating those here. They didn't receive him well. If, if you look down in verse 32, it says, When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again on this. So Paul went out from their midst. Some men joined and, be and believed. Among them were also Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others along with them. So most of the people in Athens rejected the message of Paul. 
And they continued on in the emptiness of their Epicurean thought or their Stoic philosophy. But there were people there, a few, and one really important official in the city who trusted in Jesus Christ. And within just a few centuries after the Apostle Paul visited Athens, those philosophies would still be around. But you know what the dominant view of Athens was? It was that of Christianity. The Apostle Paul, in a time that he didn't, he was in a place that he didn't necessarily want to be, he didn't expect to be there. He was just faithful. He made himself available. In church, I believe that would be true here. If we'll make ourselves available to God and just say, man, I'm going to engage with people. I'm going to bring the hope of the gospel. Some, I know people are going to mock me. I know people aren't always going to want to hear it, but I'm going to bring the truth of God to bear because I love people enough to tell them the truth. I want to give them the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are plenty of unknown gods in our culture. Uh, many people seek to, to know and understand God on their own terms. Many people want to make God in their own image, right? Rather than looking to the scriptures to see who God is, it's, it's, it's the statement, well, God... God would never do that sort of thing. God would never allow that sort of thing. God would never want you to be unhappy, right? And it's creating God in our own image. It happens all the time, both in our culture, and it happens in the church, too. Surely God wouldn't judge people. God wouldn't send someone to hell. God wouldn't want you to be unhappy in your sexuality or your singleness or your marriage or any other situation, right? That's what we believe. But the truth of God's word is that God has placed us here for a purpose. And all throughout Scripture, we see men and women who undergo various trials and difficulties. And they do so in service to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those people are to be honored. Those people are to be looked up to for their faithfulness in Jesus Christ. True life is found in following Jesus Christ with our whole hearts offering ourselves to him, not following a God made in our own image that, you know, suitably fits all of our own preferences, but following the God of the Bible, the one who created us, the one who ordered the world, and the one who seeks to redeem all things. There are people in your life that are going to seek to find life in created things rather than the creator, people that want their life to be centered around them. And, and when that happens, by the way, if your life is ultimately about you, then every bit of suffering is a profound offense. If our lives are ultimately about us and our family and our flourishing and our thriving, then any level of suffering is unacceptable. But if our lives are ultimately about God, living as missionaries of hope in a world that's broken and scarred by sin, suffering is to be expected. And in terms of dependence upon Christ, it's to be embraced. We offer ourselves in service to God. So for us, we're the church of Jesus Christ. We are the hope of the world. We have the hope of the gospel with us. And so, yes, we want to gather here as the body of Jesus Christ. We want to, to come together and encourage one another. We want to be here for each other when, when life is difficult and when times are hard. But when we leave this place, we want to go out as messengers of hope in the midst of our marketplace. And we want to take the hope of the gospel to people that desperately need to hear it. So we go to the people. We can take time to hear them, understand, and listen. But we present the truth of the gospel, and we trust God with the results. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that somebody took the time to share with us. Uh, for every believer in this room, some of us, someone somewhere, heard the gospel presented, and Lord, you've changed us. Lord, our hope and our, our trust is in you. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't keep that for ourselves, that we would be the church of Jesus Christ, that we would do as you would have done if you were living in this time and at this place, that we would go to the people who are hurting, who are suffering, who desperately need the gospel. Lord, would you use us for your purposes? May you empower us for the work. Lord, we just pray that you would turn our city upside down. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.